Okay, so let's flip the script now. Instead of being the purchaser, let's turn around and sell some stuff. Okay, we're the seller. Remember, we're merchandisers. So not only do we buy things, but we also sell them. Okay, so we're selling $500 of merchandise to a cash customer. Cost of merchandise sold was $280. If you remember, it's a two-part journal entry when we sell something. So we've got a debit to cash for $500, cash customer, and a credit to sales revenue. So that's one part of the transaction. The second part of the transaction is to record the cost of goods sold and the inventory. So we debit cost of goods sold, which is treated like an expense, or cost of merchandise sold, same thing, and you credit your inventory. The net of these two, right, sales revenue minus cost of goods sold, that is where you see that gross profit number. In this case, you made 220 The next one is sold $1,200 worth of merchandise to a customer, charge the merchandise to a Visa card. All right, so the question is, how do we treat sales when we're dealing with credit cards? Well, we treat them like cash because we get the cash right away because Visa turns around and gives the money to the uh, to the store right away, um, but they do charge an interest rate. So let's pretend like you know you've got your Visa uh, bank. So they give the money like let's say your Macy's. They give the money to Macy's pretty much immediately. They do charge two to four percent or so on it, and then they also turn around and send the bill to the customer, which could charge you interest rates of twenty two percent and higher, right? So they make money on both ends of it. Um, the best way to use is credit card is like a tool, right? You don't let them charge any interest and you turn around and pay your balances due immediately, right? You just borrow money from them. But a lot of times that's not the case what people do. But as far as Macy's is concerned, because we that's what we're doing, we're the seller here, they, we get the cash right away from the from Visa. Minus, like I said, a two per, you know a percentage discount. But we're going to kind of ignore that part for now. So we do a, the same type of sales transaction as we had above, right? We don't treat it really any differently. That extra expense, that uh, that two to four percent that we're going to get charged, it's probably going to be something like a selling expense. All right, let's look at this next one. Sold two thousand dollars of merchandise to a credit customer on a store account. The terms of the sale are two ten net thirty. Well, you may be thinking to yourself, well, we already know how to do two ten net thirty, Professor Anderson. We've been doing that. Well, yes, and no. You've been doing it from the purchaser side right where we take the discount against the inventory we have not been doing it from the sales side so now we're the seller we're now the ones offering that discount so let's look at how that gets treated all right the discount is two percent on two thousand dollars all right what we do on this end is we assume right from the beginning that the, per the person who is buying the inventory from us the purchaser is going to take advantage of the discount. Even if they haven't paid us within 10 days, even if we don't know if they're going to pay us within the discount period, right from the beginning we calculate the discount. That is different than the purchasing side of the transactions. On the purchase transactions, we didn't calculate that discount until the actual check was written, right, within that 10-day period. We recorded the purchase at the full value. We didn't take the discount into account yet. And this side, right from the very beginning of the sale, we do take into account the discount. All right, so 2% on $2,000 is 40. So the sales revenue we're going to record at not at 2,000 minus the 40 of 1960. So we record accounts receivable 1960, credits to sales revenue 1960, right? We, we record the discount right from the get-go. And debit to cost of goods sold, credits to merchandise inventory. We don't take any discount on it because it costs us $1,600 to buy that inventory. That's not changeable. We don't change that number. We don't apply the discount there. We're applying the discount to the price that we're selling the inventory at. All right, so that's different how we treat them. The timing is different, if whether we're the purchaser or the seller, on how we treat those discounts. All right, uh, receive payment from the credit customer on three within the discount period. So here we go. This is right. The people are going to pay us within the discount period. So it's just going to be simply... Debit cash, 1960. Credit accounts receivable, 1960. Easy. Well, what if they don't pay us within the discount period? We assume they were going to take advantage of the discount, but then they didn't. All right, so if that's the case, we are going to record the cash that we received. They're going to pay us the full $2,000. We're going to take the receivable off the books, 1960, and we've got an extra $40, right? That's going to be to a new account called Sales Discounts Forfeited. Okay. Sales discounts for it fitted is kind of treated like sales revenue. It adds to sales revenue because really the sales revenue is nineteen sixty plus the forty dollars of sales discounts forfeiting gives us the full two thousand dollars. So it's a credit and it is a sales account. Okay, so it's a revenue account. So we've got that nineteen sixty 
and we've got sales discounted forfeited here. We add them together to go on the income statement to show the full $2,000. We track it separately just because we do. All right, it's a discount that got forfeited. If you were running a business, wouldn't you want to know how many people are taking advantage or not taking advantage of the discounts you offer them? Probably would. So you keep track of those things. All right, moving along. So here's some practice exercises. I'm just going to show you the solutions. They are, the, they are modeled off the ones we just did. All right, so I'm just going to include them here. So this way you can check your own numbers. There we go. All right, delivery expense. Like I said, if you're the seller, it is a selling expense. It's just a cost of selling of selling your inventory is to sell is to pay for the shipping at times. So we're selling goods to a customer of $2,500. The cost of goods sold is a thousand. Okay, we've got those first two pieces, and the terms are FOB destination. We are the seller. We have to get it to the destination. That means we are paying for the shipping charges. So let's record the whole transaction. Debit to accounts receivable, credit sales revenue for the $2,500, cost of goods sold, inventory for the thousand. Here we go. You see, I'm tracking it down here. And the freight costs are $250. That's just a selling expense. Delivery expense, selling expense, transportation expense, whatever you want. And a credit to cash. Okay. So you have sales revenue. If you think about the income statement, sales revenue minus cost of goods sold would give you gross profit minus selling and administrative expenses. Okay. Tying it all together. Oh, there we go. There we go. Again. We've done all of these. I'm giving them to you as kind of a practice for yourself. Pause, do it, come back. Okay. Oop, too far. First page. What these problems are really good at is it's the selling and the buying. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, sorry. It's a side by side selling and buying. Um, so the seller entry, how we treat it when there's two terms, 210 at 30, you can see on the seller sales side that it is treated as um, as if they're taking the discount right from the beginning. We're on the buyer side, you don't take the discount initially, all right? And then what happens if it's paid within the discount period and so on, okay? Same thing, try it, pause, try it on your own, and I'll give you a solution. Oh, too far. And there you go. Okay, estimating sales returns. This is new, all right? This is new. Not new, new, but new within the last five years, new. Uh, revenue recognition standards require the company only record sales revenue in the amount they expect to realize. Sales revenue must be decreased by an estimated amount of returns. I guess what happens here is that they want to be conservative, right? I mean, that's one of the tenets of, of an accounting is to be conservative. So if you think that a significant amount of your sales are going to then be returned to you, then, you know, the GAP does not want, or FASB does not want you recording all these sales revenues with, you know, that are fictitious because you know you're going to have so many returns. So if that's the case, they're making you estimate what the discounts are going to be. All right, so let's say that these are the original entry. We have accounts receivable, sales revenue, a million dollars, cost of goods sold, merchandise inventory, 600000 What they want you to do at year end is they want you to estimate the amount of sales returns you think you're going to get, half. Um, in this case, 4% of current year sales will be returned. So we estimate 4% of that million dollars will be returned, and we estimate we're going to get back that inventory as well, 4% of $600,000. So here's our journal entry. We debit sales revenue for that 40000 credit something called refunds payable. All right, because the idea is people are going to come back and return stuff to us in the following year, and we are setting up a liability for ourselves to pay them back that refunds payable. And we have an account called estimated returns inventory, which is treated like an asset, and we reduce the cost of goods sold. The same as we reduce sales revenue, we reduce the cost of goods sold because those are inventory coming back to us and going back on our shelves. So we reduce the sales piece and we reduce the cost of goods sold piece because we wouldn't have really sold it if they returned it to us. A little confusing. All right, so what happens when people actually do start returning products? What happens is we reduce that liability, that refunds payable account, and we record the cash, right? We credit cash because we have people back their money. We put the inventory back on the shelves and we reduce that estimated returns inventory. New ruling. 
All right. I would try it for you. Feel free to try it. Pause. Go ahead. And there's the solution. All right. Uh, I have another try it for sales return to transactions. Sorry, this is, again, I'm not going to go through these. I don't want to spend the time doing that. You can do the whole point was for my class to try them on their own. So I will let you all try it on your own. Pause, and I'll give you the solution. Oops. There we go. All right. One of the last things that we're going to be dealing with is shrinkage. Shrinkage happens. It's just part of business. Inventory is damaged, it gets stolen, it gets lost, right? All those things. So if that's the case, we need to adjust our records. No matter what you're dealing with, you have to count your inventory at least once a year, all right? And when you count that inventory, very often there's going to be discrepancies. So if that's the case, let's say your books show you have $500,000 of inventory, but you actually count the inventory and it only shows four ninety. dollars Somehow during the year, $10,000 worth of your inventory went missing. Not unusual. So if that's the case, what we have to do is we have to adjust our ledgers. So we are going to reduce, well, debit our cost of goods sold and reduce our inventory by the $10,000. Why do we debit cost of goods sold? Really what we're doing is we're increasing that cost of goods sold account. And it's because that's really where all of our inventory expenses are. Don't ever use the term inventory expense, like it's not an account. Inventory expense though is cost of goods sold. All right. So if that's just a cost of selling products, it's a cost of selling merchandise. We're going to debit cost of goods sold and increase that. All right. Last thing. Closing entries and merchandiser, guess what? It's exactly the same as it would be. You have a few different accounts you have to close, but it's exactly the same process as you did for sell, for closing entries in Chapter 4. Right? We close revenue accounts to income summary. Remember the cups? If you're watching the videos, that's what you're doing. Closing expenses accounts, expense accounts to income summary, close income summary, retain earnings, close dividends, retain earnings. And that's it. Have a good day.